Hi, it's Bridget. Welcome to Above Life Channel. The purpose here is to inspire your spirit and to fill you with hope. Today, I was inspired to have this channeling session. I have no idea what it's going to be like or what we have to uh, expect from this particular afterlife guest. We're going to be talking to Regis. Do you remember Regis Philbin from Live with Regis and Kathy Lee? and many, 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 many other things. Mm -hmm. No matter how you know Rage, hopefully it will help to inspire your spirit today with his awesome and electric energy and attitude and his humor. Mm -hmm. So we're gonna bring him in and now let me tell you, so, okay, so, okay, I can feel him right now. Oh gosh, he has the sweetest smile. Oh, wow, I feel it, my eyes are leaking. <laughs> He has the sweetest smile, a round face, like rosy cheeks. He would be, you would be a great Santa. You would be a great Santa. And he says, you think so? You think so? Oh, he says, and then he kind of shakes his belly. He says, well, at times, yes. <laughs> yes, at times, yes. <laughs> Put a good meal in me, he says. He's kind of shaking his belly. <laughs> um, so I decided that I wanted to channel with you, Regis, because I was watching a Hallmark movie of all things, you guys, the other night, and it is the season for Hallmark Christmas movies anywhere, whatever, however you watch them and such. And so I, and I saw Kathy Lee. Kathy Lee was on one of them, like she was one of the guests, and I just had to laugh, and I thought, you know who would be great to channel? I told my husband, I said, Regis especially because like the end of the year, this has been a crazy year, he says, crazy, crazy, he says, crazy year, crazy, 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 he's just shaking his head, crazy, crazy, crazy. I don't really know much about you, Regis, as a person, like, I, from what I understand, you were well-liked, um, because you were someone who you get what you get, whether the camera's on or the camera's off, that you were just yourself. And lucky for you, you're able to make a career at being yourself. <laughs> and so that's how, what I get. Like, I don't know. I remember from the TV show, Live with Regis and Kathy Lee, I remember your wife's name was Joy. I remember that because I think what a beautiful name. He said, she had to be, don't you think? She really had to be quite a saint, he says, to put up with me for as long as she did, he says. And um, yes, I can feel that. A lot of um, warmth coming from her, from Joy's energy. I, so I don't really know much about you. Like, did you have kids, all that? I don't know any of that stuff. I just know that you're a big personality and it felt like a good idea to talk to you now during this time. So I would like to know, First of all, given your afterlife spirit perspective, what do you think about this year, this 2020 that we've been in as we're recording this particular session in December of 2020? So, so what do you have? What insights do you have? He says, <laughs> he says it's sort of like a mashup, like a Scorsese movie or, um, he says, you don't really know what's gonna happen next. He says, you're on the edge of your seat. And then he says, just when you think you've figured it out, something comes out of left field and you're totally confused, have no idea what's going on. What movie are we seeing again? What movie are we seeing again? Lots of energy, Regis, lots of energy. Well, do you, that's what you want, isn't it? Do you want that? Because I can bring it. I can bring the energy. Do you want the uplifting energy? That's what you want. Isn't that what you need? After this year, everything's just been so chaotic and crazy. It's like the throwing things in the kitchen and trying to find something and just everything's all over the floor and just a big mess. He says, you ever see a toddler trying to find a toy? Have you ever seen it? He says, watching the grandkids digging through the toy chest, trying to find one little tiny part for one toy with all these pieces and they're just ripping through the the toy chest and trying to find everything's a mess and pretty soon they don't even remember what they're looking for can't find it because the original part is somewhere else and it just it's just a big big mess that's pretty much sums up your your year i'm glad i left when i did glad i left when i did 
don't have to be part of this, but but I, I feel like, you know, you know, I feel like there is a, oh, he's getting a little serious now, <laughs> a tremendous opportunity. He feels very teacherly now, you guys. So we have the big personality of Regis, which you may connect to and feel, right? Have you felt that energy? Now he's kind of moving into the teacher, a little more serious vibe. Yeah, teacher-like, mentor-like. There's a lot during times like this that you can really learn from. If you, if you can give yourself that opportunity, and I know that's not easy. He's talking about like growing up poor and not having money and having to struggle and compete for every little bit, part, role, thing that you can possibly get just to make ends meet, to pay the bills, to pay the rent, and to get along. So he says, I, I don't want to sound grandiose, like this is an incredible time in our history to, to evolve as humanity. I, 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 I know that it's a real hardship for many people. And he's showing like New York and how um, he's saying Giuliani. <laughs> Boy, he really messed things up, didn't he? He's in there digging into all this stuff. Okay, let's not get political. <laughs> I try. He says, I'll try. I'll try. You know, I try. I try to walk that line. You got to walk that line, he says, as a personality, TV personality. As a host, you have to talk to people you don't want to talk to. Don't want to talk to. How do you feel about Cuomo? Let me say that. Which one? You know, in my time, it was, it was the dad, the father, and now it's the sons. And, and he would be very proud of his boys, very proud of his boys. I mean, I can, I can be sure, I can be assured, you can be assured of that. Yes, yes, very proud of his boys. <laughs> you know, Chris and I can't think of the other one. Oh, I can't think of his name. Andrew, is that right? Andrew and Chris? The mayor and I don't even, I can't even, my brain is all over the place. Um, there's many governor, journalism, journalist, mayor. There's a mayor. Who's the mayor? What's with the mayor? Not the current mayor? The current mayor? No, not the current mayor. Oh, he's trying to show me he got the keys to the city? Or something? Did somebody give him the keys to the city? Like when you retire or something, show me this key to the city. I got the key to the city. Like I'm the mayor of the city, you know? <laughs> like that, like kind of a thing. Oh, interesting. Okay. Um, he says there's a lot of us old guys that are uh, on this side, you know? And then he shows me like a Empire State Building, almost like a reflection of New York City and the skyline and all the entertainment industry and the business tycoons and things in um, New York. And then like this image, almost like a reflective energy kind of over the water that shows this level of, of the same kind of like, almost like the outline of the structure of the city and the Empire State Building. And then the energies of all of these kind of guardians that are watching out for people. And okay, so there's been a lot of scandals and things. Let's talk about that. So the good old boys network, that's an issue. That's a problem. That's a problem. He said, that's a problem. Yeah. He says, the, the, the trouble is, he says, you, you got to understand. You don't recognize that things are as messed up as they are until you get out of that. When you're in it, you can't see the problems as much, especially if you're benefiting from the, the way things are set up. You don't see. You, you just, it's not that you're a bad guy. You don't want to be a bad guy and part of a problem and, and perpetuating a problem and stopping other people from getting in. It's not so much like that. It's, it's more of a, you don't really know. You get, you get blinders. And when something comes across that multiple people start to pick up a, like a story or a you know, like what you would consider maybe a gossip, but that people kind of know is going on and then people start to actually talk about it. There's kind of a different level, he says, of understanding. So you kind of know about it, like there's rumors and things. And then when people actually talk about it in like current time, not what's happened in the past, but they talk about it like it's now and here, then you know something's up. 
something's coming. It's time for change. Change is coming. Because if you allowed yourself to really believe that these were truths, whatever it was, whatever scandal, whatever, whatever um, major change, whether it be systematic structures, whatever it is, whether it's something really um, scandalous and or something incredibly illegal and hurtful and and um, just really tears at society and the like the abuse of power he says like abuse of power those those types of things is what i'm talking about you know the white men the 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 what you refer to as privileged and he says once you start to know people are talking about whatever topic issue scandal thing it is if you're talking about it you hear people talking about it, having conversation in real time like it's present not past, even though you've heard rumors and it's been passed and it's kind of this known thing, maybe, but you think it's kind of story-like, embellished and not real. It's more Hollywood in New York kind of a thing. But once you kind of start to know that the tense of the conversation is, is changing to the present and it's actually being spoken about and talked about, then you know it's changing. Then you know something's up, something's coming, something is changing, there's a major upheaval, there's a, uh, a turning over and... Um, that's the, the, with the Weinsteins, he says, with the Weinsteins and with the, all the, um, the Me Too movement and, and, all, and those types of atrocities being, yeah, atrocity isn't the right word, those types of systematic, systemic, he says systemic, he's, I don't understand, he's like showing me like, um, like that the problem, the power and the control is built into the system. So the structure itself is damaged as it's being created and the power in the hands of a few and there becomes a lot of fear and control and manipulation and the weak versus the strong and the have versus the have nots. He says it's the same argument society has been having, civilization has been having for years, but when it is brought to light in this way and there are so many people that come out and share their, their real personal stories about it and they should, they should, they should, they're the ones that are courageous. They're the ones that are brave. They're the ones that are the change makers and, and should be recognized, you know, for that. And there are so many, there's so many stories. There's so many stories. And this is serious. This is serious business. This is serious. I know this is serious. And I want to share this or have part of this conversation with you because he's saying this, you guys, he's, saying, he's sharing this because it's time for change. It's the time. All us old guys are out. We're out. We're on our way out. And it's time for, for the women and the vulnerable to be heard and to lead and to share their stories and to create whatever's new and next, whether it be um, in, in entertainment, in which, 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 let's be clear, a story, when it's told, no matter if it's on the stage or on television or in the lyrics of a song, it is a reflection of someone's life. In some way, they were inspired or driven to write about this, to, to, to share their own part of a story. Where they, whether they change the ending so that it would be a hero's triumph or whether it be very real raw truth or even elements of multiple stories rolled into one to bring through a hard hitting theme that opens the floodgates, just busts open your heart and you feel in ways you've not felt for years. That's the kind of value that the entertainment industry, that, that production and, and actors and actresses and, and musicians and dancers and, and all of these artists behind the stage in production, in, in, in makeup and wardrobe and all of these set design, all of these incredible people so talented come together to make something that pierces into the heart 
And in that moment, there is a sense of relief. You don't have to think about your life. You can let go of your pain in a small way by that experience. And, and you can celebrate for no reason. Right now, don't you think that musicals would be fantastic in this 2020 year that you're in this mess of a mess? Don't you think that incredible opportunities for books, for just devouring books that eventually will turn into movies? will be television shows and inspiring scripts for future generations to write about and, and to help save people from the loneliness that they feel because they're reading or because they're watching something, a story, or, or what if this is the start of the birth of musicals again? Something like that, something like that, like a variety show. Not talking game show, no offense to any of the Bob Barker's, Jim Carrey, or not Jim Carrey, Carrey. Drew Carrey. <laughs> he said Carrey. Not of no offense to any of those. Admirable work. Admirable work. But I'm talking musicals like the kind we had after the war, you know, that really inspired people and, and helped people reminisce about the good old days. But now it's not about the good old days in the old ways where things were covered up. It's about the hope, you know, the hope for the future. That's what's needed right now. The hope for the future. That comes through creative endeavors like like music and writing and, and fashion design and costuming and scripts, manuscripts. And there are so many places and ways that people can share. And technology is one of those things that has been so, it's mind blowing, mind blowing. You know, he's showing, he's showing these 3D goggle things like this virtual reality thing. And he's like, how, what is this even? What is this? He says, this could have so many medical uses. It probably does. Medical uses, not just for games, video games, or some entertainment experience, but for like medical uses. Someone invented that. Someone's imagination had this idea and it may have come from a problem. And don't you think 2020 has been filled with problems? And, and, as you can see, within this one year's time, you created some incredible, incredible, momentous changes and shifts in healthcare, in medicine, in scientific research, and delivery systems. All you are, all of you are at home, and you know, in New York, you, we get the whole delivery thing. We understand that. We were ahead of you on that. We were way ahead of you, way ahead of you on that. Things were delivered all the time. It was how it worked because of the space, you know, limited space and the time and all this. Everything was limited, limited, limited. Well, now it's endless. It's endless. It just goes, time goes on and on and on and on. And now you're complaining that you have too much time and you have nothing to do. And yet on the other hand, you have, are expected to do all these things and you're not motivated to do them. And I understand, I understand. He says, um, you know, not many people know this about me, but I actually battled with, he's showing me a, showing me a lung thing, like a, almost like a, like a COPD where it's challenging in the lungs. Like, I don't know if it's asthma or some kind of a pneumonia kind of a thing here. Um, but he's also showing me um, depression, like that there was a swing with depression. And I don't know if it's, okay, so, okay, let me just, I'm feeling a lot of stuff. Okay, just a second. Let me call my energy down. It's Bridget for a sec. Let me take a breath, Regis. Rage, rage. Let me take a breath. Okay. I don't know if you battled depression or alcoholism. Now, the reason why I say depression or alcoholism is because I see the swings. And usually, you guys, when I see the swings in the energy, it could be, um, when I see that in a field, it like literally goes back and forth. It could be, the mood swings could be brought on by low times and the need to try to help the energy 
either match or balance what you're already feeling inside, which is why alcohol is a depressant. And if people are feeling depressed or down or isolated, they might choose alcohol. It might give a little bit of a woohoo if it's a little bit sugary. It'll give a little bit of a, a, a boost and then it will kind of simmer down and m mix into the low energy already. So it blends with what's already there so it doesn't create too much turbulence. It just matches that energy. And if so, so if someone is, ha is dealing, battling depression, a lot of times I'll see their energy as like low and then swing and it'll kind of go up. So sometimes they'll, they'll, they'll crawl back up and they'll work back up into a, a higher functioning level of depression and they go back down and then they go back up and then they go back down. Not bipolar, that's way more, like I literally see it like a wee, wee, I don't see that with the reaches. But I do see something about depression and or alcoholism, like a battle with alcoholism and I don't know if alcoholism was used to treat the depression or if the alcoholism out being an alcoholic piece lowered the energy of the anxiety because it almost feels like a stage fright kind of a thing and lowering the energy of anxiety such a big personality it would make sense to need to quiet down and to use something like alcohol or that somebody famous like Regis would struggle with some kind of a form of of depression and with that, then there's this expectation to perform. And so it would make sense that I would see that in his field, not near the end of his life, but earlier on, like at least 10 or 12, 15 years before that, I could see a little bit of struggles. It looks like an on again, off again scenario. And I also see some struggles with him and his wife, Joy. So I don't know if they were married, divorced or separated, or if there was any kind of, um, like with any relationship, I'm sure there's turbulence and I don't wanna get all personal or anything, but I can kind of see some things there thank you for allowing me this this space i wanted to talk about some of the ways that i know you like um um i think didn't you do one of the um ball drops in new york city didn't you do one of the ball drops didn't you weren't you the dick clark when he was having some of his health struggles after his stroke and things i think he had a stroke you guys i think that's what it was or his parkinson's or whatever it was i think it's a stroke actually but we should talk to him Oh, that would be fun. But um, didn't you do like one of the Rock and Eves kind of a thing? Yes, he says, yes, I hosted. And he's showing me three times being involved in it, like hosting three times. Um, he says, yes, yes, yes. And that's a lot of pressure. He says, it sounds like fun. It's a lot of pressure. He says, it's a lot of pressure. That's a lot of pressure. It's not, not so much fun, but I did it for my friend, Dick. I did it for my friend. So you and Dick Clark were friends. He, oh, yes, 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 yes. Um, you had a lot of friends, a lot of um, friends. Who would I be interested to know that you were friends with, that I might be surprised by? Okay, I can see his face, but I don't know. I should know who he is because he's good looking. <laughs> um, the guy that goes, all right, all right, all right. That guy, who is that? I don't have, I don't have a computer or anything I can look it up on. Who is that? Um, I can see him. Who is that guy? He was the lawyer in the movie, I think, Mississippi Burning. That's how I know him. That's how I knew of him. Good looking guy, a little bit crazy, kind of wavy hair. I can't, I'm young. I know you're yelling. I can't, you guys. I can't be psychic about everything, okay? Psychic doesn't mean you know everything. Newsflash, newsflash. If you go to a psychic and they, they say they know everything, they're lying. Okay. <clears throat> They're lying, Lockerbrug. All right, I can't think of his name. What is his name? It's driving nuts, and he's good looking too. And he was like in a car commercial recently, and he's like from the south. And oh my god, I love him too. I cannot think of his name. Put it in the comments below. By the time I post this, I'm sure I'll know <laughs> what it is. It's gonna drive me nuts. Um, him. Um, he says. Uh, can you show me? There's older people, but I mean, I'm, I'm curious about the people that I'd be surprised about. What did you think about, have you met, I assume you've met, like all of a sudden Tom Cruise comes up. I don't know why he comes up, but he comes up. Interesting, interesting um, fella. He says, interesting fella. Mm -hmm. I don't, not too much to say about that. Um, what about like, What about interesting people that are really different, like rappers and things like 50 Cent and or um, like Beyonce or somebody, you know, somebody, people that are di really different, like that I can't imagine you hanging out with. Oh, no, 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 no. 
um, we're, we're um, like he's showing me, like being at the same parties and the same galas and the same events and things like that. A lot of respect, a lot of respect for like Jay-Z and Beyonce and 50 Cent. He's saying, um, he, is that Sean? P. Diddy, Sean, is that his name Sean? I think his name is Sean, because he's saying Sean. Um, smart guy, very smart guy. Very, very smart guy. He says, very smart guy. What do you think of like Elon Musk? Like, have you met him? Mm, um, not feeling like he met him. Um, not directly, not, not like socially like that, not, not like that. Interesting guy, interesting guy. Um, he says, Neil, like Neil Armstrong, much more my, feet, my speed. John Glenn, much more my speed. He says, much more my speed. He's referring to the space stuff. Uh, much more my speed. He says, much more my speed. Um, he says, you know, I remembered when they walked on the moon. You know, I'm, I'm dating myself, but you know I'm old anyway. I'm dead, so I mean, can't get much older than that right now, huh? Um, <clears throat> Anybody else that would be interesting? Joan Rivers, did you? Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Mm -hmm. I can't even imagine the two of them in a room. Can you imagine Joan Rivers and Regis Philbin in a room together? It would just be back and forth and back and forth, like brothers and sisters, like cats and dogs. He says, like cats and dogs. You know enough to be quiet, to just keep your mouth shut. When Joan has something to say, you let her talk. You let her talk. Just let her talk, let her say her piece. He says, it was so sad when she died. It was so, he said, tragic, tragic. That did not have to happen. He says, that did not have to happen. I, so much love to, his, his, uh, to her daughter, Melissa, and, and um, her family. I just, I just, he says, it just did not have to, that was tragic, that was, that was really tragic. Um, Interesting. He's showing me like when the Challenger exploded, like the space shuttle. He, I don't know if he has a thing about space, but he's showing me another, he's making another reference to space. You guys, did Regis, was he a buff with like the moon and outer space or astro, astro, astrology? <laughs> Astronomy. <laughs> okay, Bridget. <clears throat> <laughs> that was funny, right? <laughs> oh, okay. But he's showing me the Challenger explosion, which I was in, I think, sixth grade when that happened. I remember it at school. It was early in the morning and central time. It was early. It had to have been like eight or nine. Um, it, was, it was early and he's showing me, he's feeling this impact, like being part of history. He says being part of historical moments, which... Also, so was 9-11 a historical moment. And so you were in New York at that time. He says, he's showing me being disjointed. So, okay, just a minute. So 9-11, can we talk about that a little bit? Oh, he says, oh, 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 very Catholic. Was Regis really Catholic and Irish? Was he Irish Catholic? Because it feels very, very Catholic, like lots of prayers, lots of prayers, lots of church, lots of just outpouring. That was on um, September 11th, 2001. In and out, he says, disjointed. So I don't know if he was not where he was supposed to be that day. I don't know if he was in New York or outside of New York or had trouble getting back to New York. He looks like he can't be where he wants or needs to be. Wants or needs to be. It took him some time to get to where he needed to be. That's interesting. We lost a lot of good people that day. He says, we lost a lot of good people that day. And you know, many more, many more, as John Stewart has been trying to uh, work so hard, so diligently to help protect um, many of the workers that worked in the rubble of the mess, the aftermath of 9-11 of, of the towers and lost their lives eventually over time because of it and are still struggling with cancers and toxins and horrible illnesses that they can't get assistance for, they can't work for, their families have suffered and they are paying the price. They're paying the price. Um, he's also showing me George Bush, like talking to George Bush, the president, not the older one, the younger one. <laughs> George W. I don't know. He's showing me the uh, younger one, and he's talking about um, 
just wanting to help, like seeing the pain in his eyes. He says, seeing the pain in his eyes, like he just, like being helpless, feeling helpless and, and, and then being angry, being really angry, but not having anything, not having a, a, a healthy way to channel that anger. It's, it's something that um, you go through tragedy with people and that trauma just stays with you. It just becomes a part of you. And now I know Reach because I visited New York um, February. So 9-11 happened in September and that following February of 2002, I visited New York and it was like, I had never been there before and it was the first time I'd ever been there. Only time I've ever been there, I think. Um, and subways were, um, a lot of the subway lines were down, down in lower Manhattan and you had to walk a long, long way. And there was no museum or anything like that. There, and the towers were, the World Trade Center was just a big hole in the ground at that point. And, buildings around it still had tarps over them and missing windows and it was just a it looked like a construction site is what it looked like to me when i went there to visit it, there was an observation uh, platform which was really just a bunch of plywood makeshift to go up to this level to look over this big gaping hole in the ground and then there were all these posters and that were weathered by the new york winter you know by the snow and the rain and and all that and worn, you know, faded by the sun, and that were still about people who were missing. And it was so sad. It was just so incredibly, it was like being at a, not a battleground, but like a, a grave, like just a huge grave site. And, you know, and, and, in, and, 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 to think about that experience and with where we're at now here in 2020, years later and something totally different, but a, a war of sorts uh, to our health and a crisis. And so many more people lost family and friends and the people on the front lines who have died because of their careers <clears throat> they are like the military and the army there are there that's why they call them frontline workers and like the firefighters and the police officers who've died and the construction workers who've died since from the cancer from 9-11 it's it's the I, I can't help but one can't help but feel like we are creating our own next level of trauma, collective trauma, and long-term depression, alcoholism, anxiety, by our, like, how are we encouraging other people, younger generations, to go to school to become a frontline worker when this is how we treat the frontline workers? They have to sacrifice, sabotage their own health, their own livelihoods, their families. They have to rip their families apart by being away from their, their children and their, their parents and their their spouses for months on end so that they can keep them protected. And then they might end up dying anyway. Oh, well, oh, well, you're just another, you know, soldier for the cause. Oh, well. And that part of this whole experience makes me, okay, so I wouldn't have been a healthcare worker anyway, because like the whole blood thing, you guys, I got an issue with that. Some people can't handle that. That's me. I'm not, I'm not going to be. I would have never been a nurse or a doctor. I would have never been that. And now, like that was the industry. Like when I worked in recruiting, the nursing, nursing, you could never get enough nurses. Never, 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 never. And yet, now, how do we expect, like, the way society is just expecting them to sacrifice their lives and their families? I would just quit my job and be like, okay, you know what? It's more important for me to take care of my family and to not have a job as a nurse or a doctor to do that. They have to make really tough decisions. And most people are flippant about it and don't really seem to care too much about that. That's hard for me, personally. And as a as a point in our timeline, I, I can't help but have a very strong 
what are we creating, question mark here. What are we creating? What kind of expectations do we have of people in different types of jobs, people that are empathic, that are so feeling and, and loving and caring toward other people that they're sacrificed their families, their lives, everything, pay the ultimate price to be able to do what they feel they need to do for humanity. Why are we just abusing that? Why are we using that? Why are we misusing it? That's another power trip thing. That's another taking advantage of people thing. That's not helping humanity, that's crushing it. That's crushing. That's crushing our values as kindness and compassionate beings. We need to have a web of support for people who are in these kinds of roles that are providing essential services and we're not. And what makes anybody think that we're gonna do anything different based upon how we treated the people in 9-11? And that wasn't even highly politicized as much as like this year has been. Like really think about that. And, and then ask yourself, what can I do? Like, what part of this is mine? What part of this is mine? It says, apparently it says, that needed to be said. That needed to be said. It says, what will define your generation? What will define your generation? He says, for many, we thought it was 9-11. Turns out that's not the case. Now what? That's pretty serious, that's pretty big stuff. He says, when you have the opportunity to influence, which you do, whether you're a mom and you're influencing your children and the entire lines all the way down based upon how you're influencing your children, your family, you're raising them, how you're leading by example, et cetera, et cetera, or whether you are a teacher or or a firefighter, or a doctor, or the president. Everybody, everyone, everyone has a part to play. What will your starring role be? What will it be? That's pretty profound, Regis. And I think that's exactly where we need to be right now. That's the kind of year we've had. Mm -hmm. That's the kind of year we've had. Yes. Mm -hmm. He says, you know, I have a great deal of care for the firefighters, for the police officers, for the nurses, for the doctors, for the, they, they do so much. He says, they care so much. And uh, we need to start caring for them. And not just them as individuals, but them as families. Give them the support they need for their families. We can't abandon people. It's just, he's like, it's not, it's not right. It's not right. Wow, that's deep, you guys. I did not expect that in my channeling session here with Regis. And this is gonna be something that I, I'm, I'm grateful. Thank you to you for sharing this, Mr. Regis Philbin from the afterlife, especially as it's timely. Your information, your insight is timely here in December of 2020. As you're watching this video and you can make some connections or highlight, kind of hit on some of the things that Regis and I talked about, where you can fill in some historical facts or factual data, go ahead and do that because there's a lot of people that watch Above Life Channel that don't really get how Bridget, me, how I do channeling, how I have really casual conversations with the afterlife. And so they might kind of expect psychics to do different things. <laughs> we, we kind of break the mold here, don't we, you guys? So go ahead and put in the comments below if there's factual pieces that you know about Regis where he kind of touched on or we kind of danced around, like specifically the moon thing. I'm curious about the astronomy thing. Um, also the information about his um, personal personality stuff as far as like either alcoholism or depression or any kind of a dance he may have done with that. Also, um, is he Catholic? Was he Catholic? And what's the Irish Catholic kind of tie? Also, what do you know about him in 9-11? And um, where he was on 9-11? Because I feel like he's disjointed. He's not where he needs to be. And he, he had to get to where he needed to be. And it was this whole kind of thing. And he didn't, he felt very disjointed about it. Um, also, who is the, Matthew McConaughey! <laughs> High five. <laughs> Matthew McConaughey. 
Hey, 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 Matthew McConaughey. Hi, Mac- all right, all right, all right, Matthew McConaughey. Yes, that's who I was thinking of. That's what he says. I would be surprised that he like kind of hit it off with that person, somebody he met that he kind of hit it off with. So interesting. Okay, so yes, 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 yes. Being psychic doesn't mean you know everything. Thank goodness, because... Mm, that would be kind of boring to just know everything. That wouldn't be very creative or oh, expressive or it might be kind of boring. All right. So <laughs> thank you so much for being here, for watching Above Life Channel. It's always my pleasure to channel for you. And I'm only going to channel when I can feel it and I'm inspired and, and I have that just that, oh, I need to share this with you. Oh, let's channel. Let's have a conversation with this person really authentically. So thank you so much for being here. I appreciate you. Make sure you subscribe to Above Life Channel so you never miss a new channeling video. Also, do not miss the Sunday Morning Coffee series. There's a playlist here to help inspire your spirit weekly with the podcast, Sunday Morning Coffee with Bridget. Also, check out my other YouTube channel where I do more casual, intuitive life vlogs in addition to some instructional videos about intuition and such on Fairy Grasshopper. Oh, yeah. Very Disney-like. Fairy grasshopper. Fairy grasshopper actually means magic student. Helping to encourage you to, to be inspired. Not just as a spirit, but as a person. So thanks so much for being here. Thank you very much, Regis. This is great. This was just great. Thank you. Yeah, we should. Yeah, we're going to have to talk to Dick Clark at some point. Maybe, maybe New Year's Eve. That would be fun. Thanks for being here. Have a great day.